Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome to the Primark Law video on Conrad Curse, the Night Haunter, who, in my humble opinion, is probably the most interesting of all the God Emperor's twenty sons. For Conrad is not a hero, but nor is he a villain. He is a big part of what has always fascinated me about Warhammer 40k because it seems to strive to present a universe as it is, not as how it should be or how it could be. In the 41st millennium, even the most honourable of heroes can have flaws, and even the most vile of villains can have redeeming qualities. Conrad was a result of the God Emperor's work, he was a result of Nostramo, he was a result of his own ideas and moral philosophy. He was a result of a thousand little choices made at a thousand different moments, and of course the result of the warp. On the one hand, he rescued an entire world from the tyrannical grips of criminal syndicates, who ruled through fear and terror. He gave Nostramo order, peace and law. On the other hand, he did the rescuing by viciously torturing to death anyone and everyone that did not meet his standards of justice. And in the eyes of the Night Haunter, whose justice was an absolute, a man who brutally beat and murdered other men, and a child who stole an apple so as to not starve, were the precise moral equivalents of one another criminals. Under the rule of Conrad Curse, Nostramo enjoyed a period of prosperity unparalleled in all its history. But simultaneously, under the rule of the Night Haunter, the few also suffered more than the many could ever possibly imagine. Which brings us to the question, what cost are we willing to pay for the prosperity of the many? How much must the few suffer to ensure that prosperity, and how much suffering is too much before the many start questioning the price they may all one day be asked to pay? It is an interesting question to be sure, and it is also a very, very, very grey question because there is undeniable moral wrong in torturing someone to death for stealing an apple. And at the very same time, it is also undeniably morally good that a thousand people are prospering on a planet that previously had been an absolute hellhole for the overwhelming majority of its populace. And now that I have hopefully explained to you why you should be so interested in Conrad Curse, let us move onwards, shall we, into the video itself, starting with a little bit of an author's note here. I perhaps should have said at the beginning of this video, welcome back to Conrad Curse, because he was the subject of the first Primark Law video I ever made for 40k subscribers specials. I picked him for the exact same reason as I stated previously, because I think he is probably the most interesting of all of the Primarchs. And also because at the time, we did not know that much about Conrad Curse. We knew mostly about his philosophy, about how he acted, about how cruel he could be, and yet also about the undeniable results of his cruelty which made him a very interesting piece. But now, with the release of the Conrad Curse Primark book, his journey has come to an end. Or, well, at the very least, it seems as if it has come to an end. Who knows what the future may hold. And speaking of the book, I will be making a separate video on that book as well, because I think it is a very interesting piece that sheds both a lot of light on Conrad Curse, but I also think it is a book that is somewhat flawed. So if you're interested in that, I'll be releasing that video probably somewhere near the weekend or so. Right then, let us get on with this uh, 
well, not quite remake really, but reinterpretation of the Conrad Curse lore video. And we start, of course, on Terra, deep beneath the Tibetan mountains in the Emperor's laboratory, where Conrad Curse was sleeping soundly in his gestation pod, alongside his 19 brothers. These were the Primarchs, the results of the God Emperor's first great work, although at this point in time he was not yet known as the God Emperor, a title that would eventually, I would say, be forced upon him, as it was also a title that he himself had always vehemently refused. But what other title should one grant to a being such as the Emperor? A man who had unified terror beneath his rule, and was even now in the process of finalising his plans for the conquests of the galaxy. And it was as a part of this plan that he was creating his twenty sons. From a combination of advanced technology, biomancy and… magic. Or at least, that is as good a word for it as anything. For there are forces in the 41st millennium that can best be described by using that archaic word, the gods. And it was with these very gods of chaos that the Emperor had treated for the secrets required to create his twenty perfect sons. He had made a deal with these divine entities but the God Emperor had no intentions of ever fulfilling his side of the bargain. He recognised these gods as the vile destructive entities that they were, and he would personally seek to destroy them, by utilising the very things they allowed him to create, the Primarchs. Unfortunately for the God Emperor, the gods were not so cooperative as to simply just stand by and watch their own unfolding destruction, and so they set in motion their own plans to interfere with the Emperor's grand designs. And whilst the gods are far from omnipotent, they possess a certain perspective, far beyond that of mortal men. They can perceive the weave of reality, the future and the past. They can see how it splits and how it merges, and they can manipulate this weave to their benefit. The plans of the gods are centuries if not millennia in the making, and they weave a tangled web indeed. And perhaps, if all four of the primary chaos deities were of a unified purpose, they could create a future that was truly fixed, truly inescapable. But unfortunately for them, they harbour almost as much resentment for one another as they did for the Emperor. It was only in the face of a truly dire threat to their very existence that they were able to unify for however briefly and the first step in their grand plans was the scattering of the Emperor's sons. This they achieved by manipulating both the past and the future simultaneously, along with the exploitation of a plot hole or two, they succeeded in opening up a warp rift within the Emperor's laboratory. It was this tunnel through space and time that devoured the twenty gestation pods and spat them out onto twenty different planets scattered throughout the galaxy. These planets would invariably be shaped by the coming of the Primarchs, and the Primarchs would in turn be shaped by the planets, their culture tradition, location, environment, and of course, often, less than ideal situations. The planet that Conrad's gestation pod would descend upon was one of the worst. Indeed, I would go so far as to say that only one of his brothers could claim the honour of having arrived on an even worse world. That would be Mortarian, 
whose planet was quite literally dominated by giant man-eating zombie monsters that lived in mountaintop castles, surrounded by virulent poisonous fog so vicious that it would kill an unprotected man in mere minutes. So yeah, in the contest of worst planet ever, I think Mortarian has a decided advantage. But Nostramo would be a very close second. Nostramo was a night world. Near the outer fringes of what would eventually become known as the Ultima Segmentum, it orbited a small, weak, dying star, whose light was utterly incapable of breaching the constant ever-present layer of toxic pollutants that hung heavy in Nostramo's atmosphere. This pollutant was a result of Nostramo's primary industry, being the digging, the mining, and the refining of the incredibly rare and remarkably durable metal known as adamantium. And it was in the business of extracting and working this metal that the vast majority of the population was engaged. Said population lived in five major hive cities, all located near the equator of Nostramo, the only place that remained relatively habitable as the rest of the planet was a polluted, frigid hellscape. Aforementioned population consisted of mostly baseline humanity, albeit with a handful of minor mutations brought on presumably by the environment. For example, their eyes had evolved to see better in extremely low light conditions. A very sensible mutation considering that even the brightest and most radiant of days on Nostramo would only ever barely suffice to backlight the ever-present smog that hung heavily over the planet. The near complete and utter lack of direct sunlight also resulted in albino children being born in far greater quantity than in baseline humanity. Additionally, various ailments caused by vitamin D deficiency was also common amongst the population, things such as osteoporosis, asthma, or inflammations. Small surprise, I suppose. You might think this would be easy to cure with access to vitamin D supplements, but this was not the kind of world where the civilian populace had access to, well much, if anything, in the way of even the most basic forms of healthcare. Because the population at large existed in a state little better than outright slavery, working seemingly endless shifts in the forges, the factories, the mines, and the foundries, the population toiled unceasingly beneath the ever-watchful gaze of the gangs. For they were the true rulers of Nostramo, a world where might absolutely made right, and the only law was that created by those strong enough to dictate it to others. They may have styled themselves with pretty titles such as counts, barons, marquises, or kings, but in reality the only noble thing with any of them were just those very self-same empty titles. They were in reality nothing more than vast criminal organizations, syndicates and confederations of countless gangs and bands of ruffians, brigands, murderers, thieves, arsonists, and fraudsters. And so it should come as little surprise that whilst Nostramo was an incredibly blessed world, overflowing with mineral resources that could be traded through interstellar trade with other nearby civilizations for astronomic quantities of gold, wealth, and resources, very little, if any, of that ever reached the general populace. Almost all of it was hoarded and jealously guarded by the noble classes, who only opened their coffers when it was time to wage war on their competition, uh, 
Then they would hire the various lesser gangs to rape and pillage their opposition's territories. And for a brief but glorious moment, the wealth would flow. At least a little bit. But whilst the gangs could benefit from these periods of instability and warfare, for the general populace it simply meant that yet further hardships would be heaped upon them. And yet, it says a lot about Nostramo that it was not the constant gang warfare that killed the most of Nostramo's citizens. It was not crime. It was not murder. It was not work accidents or work-related fatalities. And as you can probably imagine, the gangs gave Neri a single shit about safety precautions. Instead, the leading cause of death on Nostramo was quite simply suicide. Because for many, there appeared to be no other way out. The average Nostraman had practically no chance of ever improving his lot in life, and the only chance he might have would be to, well, join his oppressors, become a criminal himself, and either join the gangs outright, or at the very least, prey upon those who were even weaker than himself. Unsurprisingly, this led to quite the awe-inspiring bump in the crime statistics. Because when people realize that there is literally no way out beyond death or crimes, well, most people will at least try the criminal life out first. And for many, that ended in death. They tried to rob the wrong person and get shot or stabbed. They would rob the wrong gang and get hunted down and hung up on a lamppost somewhere as an example to others with ambitions beyond their stations. Or he might succeed. He might steal something valuable, or at the very least valuable by his relative reckoning. He might be able to live in relative comfort for a week or perhaps two. And once a person that has lived his entire life in absolute destitute poverty, in absolutely hopeless conditions, first finds that he has the power to improve his life by taking from others, <laughs> what do you reckon the odds are that he'll stop? And it's not like the Nostraman justice system will provide much in the way of deterrence either. Most of the major houses run their own private police forces and their own private justice systems. <laughs> justice, in this case, with heavy quotation marks and, come to think of it, police might not be the correct word either. Enforcers might be closer to the truth. And that was only when the noble houses decided to at least put on a mild pretense that they were attempting to maintain law and order. You know, when they could be bothered to pretend that they had some form of impartiality, or that they had public employees doing the policing. Whilst some houses couldn't even be bothered with that much and simply just used the gangs as police forces. No uniformed officers, just a vast quantity of bully boys to beat and berate anyone stupid enough to argue. This was the pitch black world, both figuratively and literally, that Conrad Curse descended upon in his gestation pod, in a brief incandescent meteoric descent which provided much of the population of Nostramo Quintus, the largest hive world on the planet, with their first ever glimpse of true light. Unfortunately, or depending upon your perception of things, fortunately, it would also be the last glimpse of illumination that thousands, if not tens of thousands of Nostramans would ever see, as the Primarch's armoured gestation pod impacted upon Hive Quintus with the force of a meteorite. Slicing effortlessly through 
countless dozens of building blocks until finally smashing into the planet's adamantite crust, burrowing itself so deep in the earth that the only thing that remained was a deep black cratered hole. Whatever fetid warp tide it was that had brought Conrad Kirst to Nostramo, it had made damn sure that he entered with style, having more fired him at the planet than anything else, as his arrival resembled far more an orbital bombardment than a landing. Now, granted, I suppose it is reasonable to understand that the Emperor's technicians working on massive armoured gestation pods hooked up to building block sized machinery buried beneath a mountain would not have imagined in their wildest dreams that they would ever have been required to outfit the thing to fly, <laughs> much less land. But even so, Conrad's arrival was excessively violent, even when compared to the arrivals of the other Primarchs. I guess a certain poetic point is being made here. Conrad Curse arrived as he meant to stay and as he meant to eventually leave in blood. But for now, at least, the Nostraman populace and its criminal syndicates remained blissfully unaware of what the dramatic event had brought to their home world, and what it heralded for their future. It had certainly been a catastrophe, an armoured drop pod essentially striking a major hive city, THE major hive city of the planet, is going to result in a lot of death and mangled limbs, but neither of those are rarities on Nostramo. And whilst this certainly was one of the bigger catastrophes, it was swiftly covered up, like all of the other death and destruction. In this case, literally. The crater and the hole leading deep down into the planet's crust were simply filled up with gravel and the place paved over. The local populace, however, had a strange foreboding of the place and avoided it wherever possible, considering it a sign of extremely ill fortune. But for the people of the hive city Nostramo Quintus, their bad luck was just beginning, as on one particularly dark and stormy night, even by Nostraman standards, Conrad Curse dug his way out from beneath the rubble. Now, of course, it should have been absolutely impossible for the infant that Conrad was at this point to even survive the impact and much less conceivable that the child could then have stripped his own gestation pod and fashioned crude instruments with which to dig his way through God Emperor only knows how many tons of twisted steel and debris all the way to the surface. And yet that is precisely what Conrad Curse had done. For he, of course, was no ordinary infant. He was one of the Emperor's twenty perfect sons, a Primarch, a being so far beyond what is humanly possible that it is frankly difficult to imagine. I quite like my original analogies from the video I made quite a while ago, where I essentially said that a Primarch would be more than able to take on a dozen fully armed and armoured space marines in his underwear, and come away with barely a scratch. And to make him fight against a regular human would be to have a human infant, a regular one in this case, be tossed into a vast pit containing 666 exceedingly angry and unreasonable bears, and then ask the infant to climb his way back out again. That is what a Primarch is. And in the case of Conrad Curse, he was also so, so much more. All the Primarchs had been genetically engineered and essentially programmed to fulfill certain roles in the future. They were all intended to be generals, to be leaders of the Space Marine Legions, but they were also intended to be so much more than that. 
Gulliman, for example, was intended to be the ultimate administrator, the perfect bureaucrat. Fulgrim was an artisan, Jagatai Khan was a hunter, Ross was the executioner and the enforcer. Curse? Well, he was intended to be the judge, the jury, and if need be, the executioner. If the Emperor's plans had come to full fruition, Conrad Curse would have been the absolute ultimate authority on anything that had to do with the law and justice in the Imperium, able to divide himself entirely from all sentiment of all personal opinions and all inconsequential information, to deliver a flawless verdict that would ensure justice every time. But regrettably, Conrad Kurz had not finished his education. He had received all of the hard, cold information via hypnotic indoctrination within his gestation pod. He had a perfect encyclopedic understanding of every law ever written, of every concept of law and every idea of justice. But where he was grievously lacking was in his understanding of morality and the simple basics of the human condition. And unlike practically every one of his brothers, he never got to learn any of this. He was never adopted. He was never brought in by other people, or even just captured by other humans like one of his brothers. And so he never really had any opportunity to learn. It didn't help either that Conrad's first encounter with wider humanity was a somewhat combative one. Or, oh, nay, let me rephrase that, a somewhat predatory one. For whilst Conrad Curse was a Primarch and could push himself far beyond human limitations, even his superhuman physiology had been pushed to the absolute breaking point. He was drawing upon the last reservoir of strength when he finally broke the surface. He needed nourishment, and he needed it immediately. And, well, what kind of game do you think is most abundantly available in a hive city located on a frozen hellhole planet covered by internal night? <laughs> yes. But hey, on the bright side, cannibalism was a bit of an Nostraman tradition. There were few families on Nostramo that could truthfully say that they had never indulged in a little bit of sweet pork on occasion when times were particularly hard and food was even more scarce than usual, and there were even parts of Nostraman society that was straight up cannibalistic. Gangs that operated not so much with gang territory as with gang hunting grounds. Even the other Nostraman gangs usually kept a bit of distance between themselves and those batshit insane lunatics. <laughs> I mean, it's one thing to stab a man and take his wallet. Eating him? <laughs> Somehow that crossed the line even for most Nostramans. But Curse unfortunately did not have the luxury of choice. And so, his first encounter, as mentioned, was a rather predatory one. But Conrad Curse was not your average day-to-day -day cannibal. He was a Primarch, and Primarchs have quite the toolkit of various biological functions that will allow them to survive virtually anything. And one of these is the ability to devour not only the flesh of practically any living creature without any ill effects, but also the ability to devour their memory. If Curse had landed in less of a hellhole, his first prey may have been a deer, or a rabbit, or a rat, or a brown bear if he was feeling ambitious, and through consuming the flesh of the animal, he would gain a wealth of information. These berries are good to eat. These are not. This is where water is located. These are the creatures that I prey upon. These are the creatures that I avoid. But on Nostramo, 
where Conrad curses first meal in all your likelihood was some low-level criminal with a rap sheet so long it was measured in volumes, the nature of the information gathered would assuredly be of a very different nature. These are the people I prey upon. These are the ones I have killed, stabbed, shot, beaten, stolen from, and abused. And these are the people that have abused me in turn. These are the people who frighten me, who terrorize me, who steal what little I have. It would be a tale of near unparalleled horror, and so Cursor's first meal would have taught him one thing beyond any other that this was a world that appeared to be in complete contrast to his sense of justice, which had been programmed into him at his very creation. And try to imagine for a moment Conrad Curse's mind at this point. He was but a child, but he was still in possession of vast amounts of knowledge. He did not necessarily know how to comprehend it, however, how to understand it. The Primarch book gives a very excellent example of this, where Conrad Curse knows that he must dig out a bullet that has lodged itself in his shoulder. He knows that if he does not, the wound will become inflamed. And whilst that will not kill him, it will hinder his movements, and that is a bad thing. Now, Curse doesn't know why it will become inflamed. Curse doesn't even know what inflammation is. But he has the knowledge, and so he simply acts upon what he knows. And when he assimilated the memories of that first criminal, his only frame of reference was all of the laws he knew, all of the concepts of justice that he knew but did not understand. And so, when young Conrad assimilated the memories of his first victim, all he saw was a criminal. For he was a criminal, he had committed crimes. But were they indefensible? Did he kill to protect someone, perhaps? Did he steal to feed his family? Did he commit crimes not out of want or greed, but out of desperation? There is a very good reason why, in modern law, we have the concept of ameliorating circumstances. A concept that Conrad Curse undoubtedly knew, but again that he did not understand. The concept of a circumstance in which a crime is less severe is, when you think about it, a pretty damn complex idea that requires a lot more knowledge beyond the law. It requires an understanding of circumstance, of human nature, and of necessity. What was the crime? What were the circumstances? Were they truly ameliorating, or were they aggravating? And how would that affect the sentence? Would it be lessened or harshened? And perhaps the circumstances dictate whether or not a crime has been committed at all. Jaywalking is technically a crime in several places, but you're not going to be convicted for it. You're not going to get hauled off the street for it. But if your jaywalking caused an accident, well, that changes things. But obviously, these ideas and concepts were far beyond the mind of a, well, literally weak old child. And so, he could not comprehend it. What he could understand, however, was that the man was a criminal. He understood this because the man had clearly broken laws. Conrad had then found him, and Conrad had killed him. Now, the man could never break a law again. Ergo, he was no longer a criminal, and justice had been served. In this case, quite literally although probably not on a silver platter. And as Conrad continued to prey upon the populace of Nostramo Quintus, it's not like things would be getting any better. Due to the divide between the social classes, his diet would undoubtedly consist virtually exclusively of criminals of various stripes. And due to his sense of justice, 
he would be very unlikely to prey upon someone he did not already know was a criminal in some way, shape or form. And it's not like it would be difficult to hunt him down. Every time he om nom nommed one criminal scumbag, he would learn the crimes, the names and the locations of all of his other criminal scumbag friends. For the next time Conrad got a little peckish. And soon, it evolved beyond merely satisfying his hunger. It became an obsession. This planet was utterly corrupted. It was steeped in evil, in crime and misery. And Conrad would not let that stand. He could not let that stand. It became an obsession to him. And as he continued to feast on the criminal elements of Nostramo, he developed a better and better understanding, both of them, of the world, and of himself. He soon began to appreciate that he was something quite different from the rest of humanity. He was far stronger, far quicker, and he grew far swifter as well. He also began to develop more of an understanding of his urges and of what he needed to do. He could not simply just kill all of the criminals, because practically everyone was a criminal. One of the perhaps key defining moments in Conrad Curse's early career, shall we call it, was an encounter with a certain young boy who was, along with a friend of his, involved in the recreational activity of mugging and raping a young woman. Conrad Curse, not caring one iota for the fate of the woman, only for the fact that the two young men were engaged in a crime, descended upon them and killed the first one after he had attacked him. The second, smarter than his friend, decided to make a run for it. Conrad even gave him a head start of a few minutes. This was something he had started doing, playing with his food, but he never gave them enough of a head start to get away. That was inconceivable. If he did that, then he would not have justice. And so, after a short period of time, he hunted down the second man, but upon having caught and cornered him, and dragged him up to a rooftop to finish him, Conrad was overcome with one of his visions. These happened to him on occasion, and he did not really understand it. He only knew that they were visions of the future, and he knew this in the same way that he knew that an information was bad for him, without actually understanding it. However, he claims, or at least so it was mentioned in the Primark book, that Conrad thought that there was only one true future. It felt a little bit different than all of the other futures. And so Conrad could determine that one vision to be indisputably correct. And that was the vision of himself, fully grown, clad in armour, being killed on the directive of the Emperor. And even at this early point, Conrad knew what the Emperor was. The Emperor was his father, but like everything else, he did not know who the Emperor was. He even knew that Conrad Curse was his name, but he refused to adopt it, because that was the name that his father, his Emperor, would call him. Instead, he adopted the Nostraman name for him, a name they had invented in their terror for the atrocity that haunted the knights. The Night Haunter. But this vision was different. He saw the young boy that he had chased down, and he saw a future in which instead of killing him, Conrad reached out a hand. The boy grasped it, and he pulled him up. After that, Conrad would train the boy, instruct him in his own moral philosophy, in his view of the world, and the boy in turn would hunt and kill the criminals of Nostramo, until he too found a young boy 
that he took pity upon. He would then recruit him, and that boy would recruit further acolytes in turn, until eventually, little by little, ever so slowly, the rising numbers of acolytes would place their combined weight upon the levers of change, and turn Nostramo into a brilliant society. But there was also another vision. In this vision, Conrad did not kill the boy. He reached out a hand, just like in the first one, but this time, instead of grasping Conrad's hand, the boy grasped a dagger that had fallen right next to him, and plunged it into Conrad's chest, puncturing his secondary heart. Even at this young and immature age, something like that would not have killed Conrad. He was a Primarch, he could survive far, far worse than that, Indeed, mere moments previously, he had busied himself digging bullets out of his shoulder blades. But he saw that this would cause him enough pain and agony in combination with his previous wounds to allow the boy to escape. The boy would grow famous for this. The boy who had stood up to and wounded the Night Haunter. He would rocket to the top of Nostraven criminal society, and he would spread a reign of fear and terror more horrible than anything previously seen on the planet. And in turn, the Night Haunter's reign would be lessened. People would no longer fear him. They would no longer cease their criminal activity for fear of his attentions. They would instead redouble their efforts, now believing him to be vulnerable, to be just a man, rather than the myth that was Night Haunter. Curse could not allow that future to come to pass. He could not risk it. He struck out and crushed the boy's windpipe and his spine in one swift move, and then lowered the limp body tenderly to the ground. A clean kill, a quick death. Most unusual for Conrad Curse, especially at this time in his career, when he was beginning to realise that fear and fear alone was what he could use to change Nostraman society with. However, there is an interesting thing here. Curse claims to have been able to tell apart the true future, or at the very least, the one true future, suggesting that he believed with absolute certainty that he could in some way understand but in this case, the future in which the boy reached for the knife and stabbed the Night Haunter was an impossibility. An impossibility that Conrad Curse surely must have known about. His ribcage was a solid piece of fused bone that no knife wielded by a young boy could ever possibly hope to penetrate. And even if he could have, the knife was simply too far out of reach. Now it should be said that at this point in time, Conrad had just emerged from one of his visions. He would have been confused, disoriented, and bewildered. Even his Primarch mind may not have been able to fully process the implications of his surroundings. And he may, ironically enough, simply have reacted immediately out of fear out of fear that his plan, his future, the goal that he was pursuing, would be destroyed by making the wrong choice. And so he simply chose to err on the side of caution. But I think we're going to talk more about this in the Conrad Curse Primark book video instead, because there are some wider implications at play here. Although there is one thing I'd like to address right now, in fact. In the original lore, Conrad Curse launched his reign of absolute uncompromising terror in Hive Quintus, where soon an unofficial curfew was imposed where nobody would step outside during the darker hours of the day, and the criminal organizations 
Swiftly realizing that there was a particular pattern to the Night Haunter's petitions, began getting very, very worried indeed. They tried to haunt him. They put out larger and larger bounties on the myth known as the Night Haunter. The upper nobles began getting worried when the gangs could not deal with this vigilante. They dispatched their own enforcers, but they did no better than the gangs. Even on a handful of occasions where they managed to engage Conrad, the best they could ever possibly hope to do was wound him. A normal human has about as much chance of killing a Primarch as you have of finding an honest politician near election day. A literal impossibility. But eventually, Conrad Curse developed more of a... shall we say ideology? More of a idea of how the world was to be and how he could shape society to fit that idea. He noticed that no matter how many criminals he killed, it simply didn't matter. The crimes continued unabated. They feared the Night Haunter, but he was merely another source of death. A thing every criminal on Nosramo was already intimately acquainted with. But Conrad still recognized that fear was a valuable tool. Fear of consequence might prevent an action, and therefore, logically speaking, absolute fear of an unavoidable consequence should, in theory, prevent further criminal activity. Conrad just had to find something that people were afraid enough of. And so he started experimenting with torture with ways of displaying his victims. At first, he started out quite gently, by Conrad's standards, leaving victims who had been bruised and battered to the point of being completely and utterly unrecognizable, mere misshapen hunks of flesh that lay conspicuously on street corners and in the middle of the road. This had an effect. The hunting parties targeting him increased, and lacking much in the way of other metrics, this was a good enough way for him to measure results, and so he continued. He became ever more creative, ever more inventive. And remember, Conrad Curse was a primarch. It was not merely his strength, speed, and agility that was enhanced, it was also his mental faculties. Conrad Curse would by any metric be considered an absolute genius, a savant at virtually anything he put his mind to. And in this particular occasion, his primary occupation, his hobby, was torture. Corpses would be found inside of locked apartments, flayed, their skin used to drape the walls, and their blood used to paint the ceiling and the floors. Others would be found impaled upon lampposts with their skin twisted into little knots all across their bodies. Others would be delivered piecemeal to friends and colleagues. A kingpin might, over the course of months, receive tiny little pieces of his most trusted lieutenants, always delivered in an intimate area, his bedroom, his lavatory, his hobby room, etc, etc. This kind of mental torture was another arena in which the Night Haunter excelled, for he swiftly realized that mental torture could be just as effective, if indeed not more so, than literal physical torture. He began to grow and nurture the terror that he created, shaping it, spreading it, and nurturing it, like a botanist might a fine garden. He began to display his victims ever more publicly, and none dared take down the grisly displays for fear of insulting that which went bump in the night. 
This went on for years, a sustained and continued campaign of unrelenting, unmentionable horror until everyone, from the highest noble to the lowest beggar, feared to even so much as whisper his name, lest it be considered an offence against him. Eventually, inevitably, the high nobles of Nostramo Quintus gathered together in a conclave to discuss what could possibly be done about the monster in their midst. If they could pool resources and finally hunt him down, if they could shut down the entire city and flood it with their gangs and enforcers, then surely a man, no matter how horrible, could be killed. Or at least so they were in the middle of convincing themselves when a shadow in the corner of the room detached itself and revealed the Night Haunter. But, for once, he had not come to punish them. He had come to speak, or more correctly, to make a demand. The High Nobles would submit themselves to him, to his rule, and his ideals of law and order. And anyone who were foolish enough to deny him that, would not be leaving the Conclave. Most, wisely, acquiesced to the Night Haunter's demands, and those who did not, they became yet further examples of why you should not deny Conrad Curse. Now having access to the city as a whole, to its libraries, to its record halls, to its justice system, whatever little remained of it under millennia of gang rules, Conrad devoured the information and the knowledge voraciously. He used his intellect now not merely just to hunt down the criminals, but to improve Nostraman society in its entirety. Under the rule of the Dark King, Nostramo Quintus grew unfathomably wealthy. Production quotas of adamantium shot through the roof, and simultaneously safety measures were implemented. Trade increased, favourable diplomatic relations were established both with off-world partners and the other Hive cities. But despite now being king of Nostramo Quintus, Conrad did not give up his day job just yet. He continued to hunt through the streets for any remaining criminal elements, now with the full force and backing of the Hive itself. Any remaining criminal elements, foolish enough to mistake the rise of the Night Haunter for nothing more than yet another upstart aristocrat scrabbling for power, soon learn to their great and extended displeasure what an apocalyptically terrible decision they had all made. And soon thereafter, when Conrad began televising his chastisement sessions, and made it illegal to not own a television set, the crime rates plummeted so swift and hard it left a metaphorical crater in the statistics. And it didn't take long for the other hives to get the message either. Hive Quintus was growing unimaginably influential and wealthy under the rule of the Night Haunter. This fact alone would very much so be enough to convince many in the masses that maybe the rule of Conrad Curse was not so bad after all. As long as they stuck to his rules and his laws, they would get to live lives better than anything they had ever imagined. Of course, the noble families and the criminal syndicates continued to cling on to their power for quite some time. But after Kerr started making saber rattling noises about how he might have to involve himself more directly in the business of other hives, they too swiftly began to see reason. And soon, the entirety of Nostramo, all five of its major hive cities, hailed the Night Haunter, Conrad Curse, 
as their undisputed King of the Night. This was unquestionably a monumental achievement for the Night Haunter. He had taken a world steeped in criminal anarchy and enforced upon it not just laws, rules and regulations, but also he had improved it. Nostramo had always had the potential to be a wealthy and prosperous world for everyone. But since all of the resources had been hoarded by the few, that potential had never been fulfilled. Under the rule of Conrad, however, people were quite literally afraid of having more than their neighbours. But they never knew when Conrad might decide that being lacking in civil spirit might also be considered a crime in some way, shape or form. And so Nostraman society at large grew prosperous, grew ordered, and the vast majority of the population lived better than they could ever even have imagined only a handful of years prior. This did result in Conrad Curse receiving a significant following amongst the lower classes, Many quite earnestly and honestly subscribed to his way of thinking, his ideals, that the few must suffer in the name of the many. And of course, quite a few outright loved him for what he had done. He had undisputably improved Nostraman society astronomically. But there will always be those who are discontent. And on Nostramo, there were more of these malcontents than most places. For one must remember that during the days of high criminal activity, Nostramo was a paradise for those who simply wished to live by their own rules, those willing to take what they could from others, and those who were more than happy to live by the rule of the strong, for they themselves were mighty. But as long as Conrad Curse was around, they would never dare to do anything against him. He had made too thorough an example of anyone who had tried. But the biggest point here is that in the old law, Conrad Curse did all of this in a cold and calculated fashion. He specifically went out there to cause as much horror and terror as possible with the goal in mind of ordering society. We even have tales of him, for example, dragging an old man up to the top of a hive spire, preparing to fling him off it for some crime he had been caught committing. But Conrad pondered why the man was crying, why he was resisting why he was lamenting his fate. The man had committed a crime, and this was the unavoidable consequence. Why should the old man fear that? Why should the old man not understand that? For surely he himself understood that there had to be a consequence for his actions. And most puzzling of all, the old man appeared to be more afraid of Conrad than the sheer drop that he was dangling him over. This would later become one of the core fundaments of Conrad's philosophy of fear and terror. If he could not prevent crimes because people would commit them in order to live, in order to satisfy themselves or in order to revenge themselves, then Conrad must simply make those things not worth it. He must make himself into a being of such unnatural terror that people would rather starve to death than invoke his wrath. People would rather overlook the death of a loved one at the hands of another, safe in the knowledge that whatever fate awaited the other would be far worse than any revenge the man could possibly come up with. And in the end, this resulted in the Night Haunter taking control of Nostramo Quintus, in order to shape the 
perfect society. At least, perfect in his own eyes. This was not an instinctual action. These were not the actions of a sadistic madman, or someone who simply just took pleasure in killing. For if that was the case, why would he bother to order society? Why would he bother to create a better society? Why would he worry about gaining knowledge and running Nostramo Quintus in an effective fashion? If all the Night Haunter wanted was the suffering of others, surely he would simply have remained a wraith hunting in the night. And if all the Night Haunter cared about was pure undisturbed order, surely he would simply have slaughtered the entire population. It's not like he couldn't have done it. He became the ruler of Nostramo Quintus, a whole hive city. He could have launched a war of annihilation upon the other cities, and then spent the rest of his days hunting down the few scattered scared remnants in the ruins of their once homes. Conrad Curse chose not to do these things. And yet, in the new books, he is described far more as just a sadistic creature. Something that hurts others merely for the act of hurting them, to take pleasure in their pain. There is in the new book described an encounter with a woman who was planning to kill herself, something that Conrad viewed as a crime, and he justifies this to himself because if everybody simply took the easy way out, then there would be no change. They would view their situation as hopeless and then kill themselves, instead of working together with one another, with the other citizens of Nostramo, to improve the planet. Therefore, the person in question, by taking their own lives, stole from society impetus, stole drive, and stole a better future for tomorrow. Now, doubtlessly, this is a rather extreme interpretation, but the logic as far as creating an ordered society is sound. Every person that takes his own life is a resource to society that is lost, and it also causes yet further grief and bereavement on behalf of those who was close to that person. In the book, however, Conrad Curse tells the woman that he does not take any pleasure in what he was about to do, but he writes in his memoirs that this was a lie, and that he knew it was a lie. And this appears to be in sharp contrast to what Conrad Curse actually did. Again, as mentioned, if all he wanted was pain, there was no reason for him to organize society in action that again, unquestionably, decreased the amount of overall suffering. So how do we tie this up then? How do we bind the Conrad that was to be with the Conrad that was? How do we make all of this make sense? Well, here is my theory. I think that the Conrad Curse, who penned his memoirs titled simply The Dark, in a pitch black chamber in his fortress on the world of Tsagualsa, surrounded by the scattered and desecrated remains of slaves and servants, was not the same curse that brought order to Nostramo. The Conrad curse on Tsagualsa was a broken, monstrous creature, who seemed to act without rhyme or reason. At one point, a servant made his way into the Night Haunter's chamber to inform him that his sons wished to speak to him one last time before the ordained hour of his death. Conrad found this to be immensely amusing. His sons, his legionnaires, his adeptus astartes who should know no fear, did not even dare to come speak to him in person. Instead, they sent a poor, unaugmented, half-starved serf to bring their message to him. It amused Conrad so greatly that he wanted to send the serf back to them, 
and tell them all that they were cowards, that they were beneath his contempt and that if any of them so much as dared to harm the serf for telling them that, Conrad would hunt them down and punish them appropriately. That sounded like something the Conrad curse of old would do, terror to force compliance. But then as the servant turned to leave, Conrad curse told him that there was one further thing that the servant could do for him. Conrad then ripped the servant apart and devoured his heart as a light snack whilst he continued his conversation with a statue of the emperor he had shaped and fashioned from the broken bodies of a hundred other servants. Yeah. <laughs> this, Conrad, was patently insane. Whereas another Conrad, during the early days of the Crusade, was different. Allow me to recount to you a conversation he had with one of his sons. Why do we kill the way we do, Ajman Kai Vor? Why do we skin and torture? Why do we hurt those we would save? To strike fear, responded Vor. Fear is the greatest of all weapons. Fear will cow a world where guns will not. We spill bloods to save blood. Curse nodded. That is so. What is the utility of terror? Terror is a clean blade. It cuts, it disarms an opponent without doing them harm. Terror is the friend of compliance. Once again, this gives us the picture of a Conrad curse who uses fear and uses terror to enforce order and compliance, rather than simply reveling in the emotions themselves. Meanwhile, the Conrad curse on Tsugulsa had made a room, an entire room of his fortress, from the stitched together bodies of serfs. A room through which Conrad Kerr strode, in full plate armor, crushing bones and bruising flesh, before after having crossed the room, turning around and thanking them all, genuinely so, for their pain. The contrast between the two could hardly be any more stark. So how do we explain this? How do we explain the drastic and dramatic transformation that Conrad Curse went through? Well, it would appear as if Curse suffered from a split personality. There was Conrad Curse, and there was the Night Haunter. The latter was a monster a pure, undiluted creature of the night that shamelessly enjoyed the pain it caused others, and had no greater goal than to revel yet further in the suffering and torture of those lesser than itself. And the other was the idealist, the Conrad curse that could see a better future, the curse that kept telling himself that the future was not truly fixed, that there was a point in struggling against it, that there was a reason to create order, that there was a greater goal to his actions. These two personalities were diametrically opposed to one another, and when one was in the ascendant, the other would constantly gnaw and chip away at it. In the case of the Great Crusade era Conrad Curse, who was the ordered version of the personality, we can see him slowly slipping into madness as his legion became corrupted around him. As the Great Crusade ground on, Conrad spent more and more time away from Nostramo, leaving the ruling of the planet to a conclave. Eventually, however, this conclave was overthrown by the old criminal syndicates, who began abusing their power and position. Even those within the Legion itself began counteracting Conrad Curse's ideals and goals. 
To begin with, the Night Lord's Legions was made up of what we could perhaps call idealists, those who subscribed to Conrad Curse's way of viewing the world. They shed blood to save blood. And there was an irrefutable logic to their actions. The Eighth would invade a world and butcher a single city in such an extraordinarily horrific and artful way that the rest of the planet's population would do anything to avoid sharing in that one city's fate. Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions would die in excruciating agony, but in return, billions would be saved. Compare that to the wars of annihilation of the other Primarchs. Compare that to the fury of the Sons of Rus, that might take every single city, that might bathe every street corner in blood as they fight their way from city block to city block. One could certainly argue that one way is more honourable than the other, but is it more ethical? That, I suppose, is the difficult question. But the necessities of a galaxy-spanning crusade meant that Conrad could not be everywhere at once. Nostramo began to slip away from his grasp, and so even did individuals within his own legion. Those who decided that there were benefits to be had from being a Night Lord and sought to turn those benefits into privileges and advancements, not for the Crusade, not for the Legion, not for Curse, but for themselves. The rot had set in, and it would slowly continue to devour the Legion from the inside out, and Curse was too slow to notice and too slow to react in and of itself, an interesting plot hole. Conrad Curse knew how he would die. He knew the state in which his legion would be nearing his death, and yet he did not notice the creeping corruption? Odd, to say the absolute least. But perhaps it can be explained by the actions of the Night Haunter at the time. Conrad Curse, during the early years of the Crusade, had taken great pains in looking the part of a leader of men, in ordering his legion. He maintained a far higher standard of personal hygiene than he did as the Night Haunter. He looked like a genuine lord of men and demanded the same of his legion. He demanded they control themselves, and only inflict just enough pain and just enough fear to achieve their immediate objectives. But slowly, over the course of the Great Crusade, he began to change. This was apparent in the eyes of those closest to him. People such as Sevatar, for example, noted that their lord became ever more bedraggled, ever more filthy, ever more unorganized. And this change coincided with another rise in the frequency of Conrad's visions. They would come upon him ever more frequently and ever more viciously, showing him the future steeped in blood even as he desperately sought to avoid that very selfsame future. It chipped away at his sanity. This, I believe, was the Night Haunter fighting to emerge at the fore, and we can even identify the very moment when the Night Haunter gained the advantage. During a meeting with his commanders, when he was trying to order his legion, Conrad Curse was overcome with a brutal bout of visions of the future, so overwhelming that he could barely hold it in for long enough to empty the chamber of his leaders and lords. When the visions finally subsided, he came to realize that in the middle of his fits, he had most brutally and viciously slaughtered one of his legion serfs. A man that had committed no crime, that was guilty of no misdeed. 
and what was even worse was that his death served no purpose. There was no justification in the Night Haunter's actions, and so Conrad Curse had to arrive at the inescapable conclusion that he himself had become what he hated the most, a criminal, a killer, and a murderer. This mental break could not have happened at a worse time, as Conrad was on the way to a meeting with two of his brothers, Fulgrim and Rogal Dorn. He intended to make one last effort to convince them of his visions and to warn them of the future. But he was overcome with another fit, attacked Dorn and left him on the verge of death. Dawn was found bleeding, with great gashes ripped from his torso, and Conrad Curse standing over him, weeping, having just realised what he had done. Conrad first allowed himself to be taken away, but later broke free, slaughtering the Imperial Fist's honour guard that had attempted to detain him. Making his way back to his 8th legion, he then departed for Nostramo to carry out the ultimate sanction upon the planet that he now blamed for all of his woes. And not without reason. It was from Nostramo that the rot had spread throughout the 8th legion. It was Nostramo that was guilty of corrupting the Night Lords. And so it was Nostramo that was guilty of bringing about the future that Conrad has so desperately tried to avoid. Exterminatus was the only solution. But, without having explained his actions to his brothers, it appeared to the rest of the Imperium as if Conrad had finally gone insane. And well, to a degree he probably had. The Night Haunter was now well and truly in Ascendant. From here on, and until his eventual death, the Night Haunter was the one in charge, and Conrad submitted himself fully to what he now perceived as immutable fate. He was simply playing out a role, whilst telling himself that he was finally being honest. He sided with Horus, he slaughtered his brother's sons, fought the other Primarchs, and destroyed entire worlds, butchering the civilian populace not in the name of compliance or order, but purely for the sake of butchery in and of itself. But it did not take long before Conrad Curse began to chip away at the Night Haunter. First there was Vulcan the Primarch of the Salamander's Legion that Conrad had captured during the Drop Sight Massacre. Conrad hated Vulcan with a passion that he reserved for very few individuals indeed, for Vulcan was the exact opposite of Curse. Whereas he was a cynic who believed that humanity could only be controlled through force, fear, and violence, because he had seen far too much of the darkness, Vulcan was perhaps the kindest, gentlest, and most human of all the Primarchs. He believed in humanity, and he would happily put it before himself. Conrad Curse killed Vulcan, but was then aghast to realise that Vulcan could not die. No matter how many times Curse killed him, no matter how much torture he heaped upon him, no matter how thorough the annihilation of Vulcan's body, he would always return to life. The Emperor had gifted Vulcan with unbelievable levels of cellular regeneration, to the point that even hanging him in front of a starship's engines could not kill him. This vexed Conrad to no end, for in the depths of his mind, he was continuously comparing himself to Vulcan, and finding himself coming up short. And unlike with all of the other annoying things, the little reminders that he could simply crush or kill, Vulcan would not perish. 
And so Conrad Kerr set about trying to break his mind instead. He put Vulcan through a series of impossible trials, placing the lives of innocents in Vulcan's hands in unwinnable scenarios. At one point, for example, he bound Vulcan's hands to unbelievably heavy weights, and had these in turn connected to a giant block of stone hanging above a room filled with captured Imperial Army personnel and serfs, innocent men, women, and children. As long as Vulcan kept pulling on the chains, the stone block would be kept just above the innocents. But over the course of hours, possibly days upon days, slowly but surely, the incredible weight wore Vulcan down, until the stone block inched closer and closer and closer and eventually crushed the innocent people within the trap. There was no way for Vulcan to have succeeded. Curse had designed the test with that in mind. And yet, no matter how many tests like that Curse put Vulcan through, Vulcan would not break. He'd never stop trying. He always, no matter how impossible the task seemed, would continue to try. That infuriated Conrad and he placed one last test in front of his brother, an impossible maze supposedly constructed by Petarabo himself. The idea was to force Vulcan to run this impossible maze for eternity, whilst Curse mocked him. But once again, Vulcan somehow found a way through. He made it to the heart of the labyrinth, where his hammer, Dawnbringer, was placed. But having arrived at the heart of the labyrinth, Vulcan found that Curse was not going to play fair. He had placed Dawnbringer inside of an energy field to make it impossible for Vulcan to reach it, and Curse himself had also arrived, intending to subdue Vulcan and put him through yet further trials. Curse, after all, had all the time in the world, and he would break Vulcan no matter how long it took. But Vulcan had learned a thing or two about his brother as well, and he began to taunt Conrad, calling him weak for having given up hope, for having broken. The gambit succeeded. The Night Hunter flung himself at Vulcan, who grabbed the Primarch of the Night Lord's Legion, easily overpowered him with brute strength, and flung him like a hammer towards the energy shield, freeing Dawnbringer. Activating the secret teleportation field hidden within the hammer, Vulcan disappeared in a flash of brilliant light and appeared in the upper atmosphere on the other side of the galaxy on McCrag, where he plummeted down through the burning atmosphere, his body being burned to a crisp, and finally breaking Vulcan's mind, at least temporarily. But Curse knew nothing of this, and his apparent defeat at the hands of Vulcan did not sit well in his tortured mind. It would further wear away at him over the coming years, as he engaged in the Thramus Crusade against the Lion and his Dark Angels. Conrad had been ordered to keep them busy, and the two engaged in a lengthy war of hit and run. The two Primarchs appeared to be nearly perfectly matched. Every time the Dark Angels would annihilate a Night Lord's fleet, the Night Lord somewhere else would annihilate a Dark Angel's fleet. Every time a planet was captured, another was lost. And so on and so on, the conflict raged for three full years. Until a curse attempted to negotiate with his brother. Via a beacon placed in space, he gave the Lion a series of coordinates, a planet in the middle of nowhere far away from both fleets. 
here he tried to convince the lion, or oh, perhaps he was trying to convince himself, that Horus's cause was just, and that the Emperor was the one that was truly in the wrong. But the lion would have none of it. He had come not to listen to Conrad curse, but in an attempt to end the conflict, although he did at least allow Conrad to speak his piece first. Eventually, unavoidably perhaps, the two fought, and Conrad appeared to have the upper hand over the lion, but the lion was saved by one of his Dark Angel's honor guards who had come down to the planet with him. Eventually, both Primarchs were dragged away from the battlefield, severely wounded. And that was the last attempt at any form of diplomacy either party made again. Eventually, the Lion's superior tactical acumen would win out. In a masterfully executed attack upon the main Night Lord's fleet, helped in no small part by the ever more maddened plans of the Night Lord, a heavy defeat was placed upon the Eighth Legion. Conrad Curse was captured, and despite a desperate boarding action launched by his first Captain Sevitar and the elite Atramentar Terminators, they were unable to rescue their Primarch. Sevitar was captured, and whilst Conrad Curse did eventually manage to escape, he was trapped aboard the Dark Angel's flagship Invincible Reason and there he would stay until the Dark Angels arrived in the skies above Macrag, and Curse found another opportunity to escape down to the Ultramarine's capital planet. There, Conrad ran into another of his brothers, Gilliman, who Conrad also immensely disliked, and he attempted to teach him a lesson in fear and terror the likes of which even Nostramo had rarely seen. He created several distractions to draw Gilliman and his guards away from the palace, all in an attempt to bereave Gilliman of the person on Macrag that he held most dearly, his adoptive mother. But he was ultimately thwarted in this goal by a contingent of space wolves, who managed to hold the maddened Primarch at bay for just long enough. But it was not Gilliman who was the most important brother that Conrad would meet on Macrag. Instead, that honour would go to Sanguinius, whom Conrad had a very strange and special relationship with. Conrad considered Sanguinius to be the only truly noble Primarch, the only truly just individual in the entire galaxy, perhaps. And thusly, Sanguinius was also the only individual that Conrad Curse would allow to judge him. This is where it becomes apparent that Curse was chipping away at the Night Haunter's sanity. For Conrad wanted Sanguinius to kill him. He tried to force Sanguinius to kill him. He used Sanguinius sons against him, capturing them and putting them in dire peril, threatening to kill them if Sanguinius did not strike the Night Haunter down first. He placed himself right in front of his brother, unarmed and vulnerable, not resisting in the slightest, and practically begged the angel to end his existence. It is clear that Conrad Curse was still in there somewhere, and was fighting against the Night Haunter's actions. He wanted justice, he wanted vindication, he wanted to be judged as he had judged others, but he considered none but Sanguinius worthy of passing that judgement. Unfortunately for Conrad, his brother was a literal angel, and even in the face of Conrad's uncountable atrocities, Sanguinius refused to strike him down. It would take two more years of constant terror attacks 
and assaults upon the population of Macrag both by the Night Haunter and rebels that he had fermented in the high mountains of Macrag, before the lion managed once again to corner and capture Curse, and place him before a tribunal consisting of himself, Gilliman, and Sanguinius. At his trial, Conrad continued to defend his actions, arguing that he had been made to be the way he was by the Emperor, and so his crimes were the Emperor's crimes. Conrad was merely fulfilling a role and was therefore blameless. <laughs> An excuse that he himself would of course never have accepted, but then again I believe he knew that. I believe that this was merely, once again, another attempt on behalf of Conrad to finally have his brother execute him. And after much deliberations, it appeared as if Sanguinius was finally ready to acquiesce. But just as Conrad was to be executed, the lion intervened. After having been one of the foremost advocates for simply killing the Night Haunter, he now pointed out that the Night Haunter's vision suggested that he would be killed by an Imperial assassin on the orders of the Emperor, which meant that the Emperor was still alive. At this point in time, Gilliman had created his Imperium Secundus, assuming the rest of the Empire to have already fallen and the Emperor to be dead. But now that they had at least some evidence to suggest that not only was the Emperor alive, but still fighting, Sanguinius determined that all efforts should be made to break out of the ruin storm surrounding Imperium Secundus and go to the Emperor's aid. A gambit in which they were, ultimately, successful. And so one could say that, in his own twisted way, the only reason why the Imperium was eventually saved and survived the Horus Heresy at all was because of Conrad Curse. Quite something to think about, is it not? The Lion also argued that Curse be kept alive for the time being, and volunteered himself to be Conrad's Gowler. He would keep him aboard his flagship and attempt to use Conrad's gift or curse of precognition to determine the future events and how to best use them to benefit the Imperium's cause. A novel idea, certainly, but I have always found this to be a little contrived. I honestly cannot imagine that the Lion would think that Conrad Curse, of all people, would be overly forthcoming with such information, even though at this point the Lion must certainly have suspected that Curse had a soft spot for Sanguinius. This was to be further proven as well on Davin, where Sanguinius was abducted, one might say, by demonic creatures. Curse seemed genuinely worried about Sanguinius, proving once again that he actually did love Sanguinius. If only the two had been kept closer together, Maybe the tragic fall of Curse could have been avoided, but then again, maybe not. Curse viewed Sanguinius as the only flawless being in the galaxy, as the only one with the right to judge him. I wonder if Curse would have still believed that quite as much after learning that Sanguinius had a flaw of his own as well. It may have convinced Conrad once and for all that there was no light in the galaxy, only darkness. But on the other hand, it may also have convinced Conrad that maybe he and Sanguinius were not so different after all. They both had the potential both for darkness and for light, and in that comparison maybe Curse would finally have realised that he did not have to be the Night Haunter. Who knows? It is unfortunately a question to which we will never have an answer.
And eventually, at long last, after many adventures, I suppose you could say, Sanguinius decided that Curse should be allowed to seek his own fate. He placed Curse within a stasis pod and fired him out from his ship leaving Curse to drift throughout the galaxy until his fate finally caught up with him. It would be long after the end of the Horus Heresy, but eventually Conrad Curse would be picked up by, quite literally, the unluckiest ship in the entire galaxy, who thought at first they had gotten quite the prize, a piece of high technology drifting through the void. Easy money until the thing inside of the stasis pod somehow managed to get out of the stasis field. Something that should have been impossible. Conrad Curse then went on to slaughter the entire crew, except for one single serf, which he apparently took pity on? <laughs> or that he simply kept alive to amuse himself during the long, long years of his travels to Tsugulsa, where he would finally meet his fate at the hands of the assassin M. Shen, the fate he had so long prophesized. But before that, he as mentioned, wrote his memoirs, and now we can see that the Night Haunter was starting to fall away, and Conrad Curse was once again in ascendance. The Night Haunter's surety had been shattered. He had believed that there was no way to avoid this fate. He had believed that this was prescribed, but as he wrote, as he remembered, and as he spoke to a statue of the Emperor made of the grisly remains of slaves, he began to doubt himself. He began to question if fate really was immutable, if he really did not have any agency. How did he arrive at this point? Because when he had looked back, it seemed as if it was his choices that had brought him here. And finally, in what some might say was one last complete fit of madness as his psyche broke down again, the grisly statue of the God Emperor came alive and began to speak to Conrad Curse. And after the conversation, Conrad would himself say that he both knew that the Emperor had not spoken to him just as much as he also knew that the Emperor had spoken to him. On the one hand, it is far from inconceivable that the Emperor could have had the power to speak directly to Conrad Curse. On the other hand, that would also bring up the question why he had not done so sooner, and the fact that the apparition had not told Conrad anything that Conrad did not already know. Conrad blamed himself for his failures, or more correctly, he blamed Conrad Curse. He exalted the Night Haunter, for whilst the Night Haunter was a monster, he had succeeded in his goal. He had ruled Nostramo through fear and terror. The Night Haunter was just. He had created a better society, whilst Conrad, who had attempted to create a better society on a galactic scale, had failed. Ergo, the Night Haunter was strong, and Conrad Curse was weak. But of course, this comes across as nothing more than a transparent excuse. The Night Haunter only succeeded in his limited goal, and even then he only succeeded as long as he constantly maintained his rule of fear and terror. The moment the Night Haunter was away, the criminal mice once again came out to play. And whilst it certainly is true that Conrad Curse also failed, he did far more than the Night Haunter ever had. Conrad Curse did try to fight against his future, 
And if it were not for the intervention of the Night Haunter, his second persona, maybe he could have succeeded. Maybe he could have convinced Rogal Dorn and Fulgrim of the necessary steps required to cleanse his legion. Maybe he could have convinced them to sanction the purge of Nostramo. He had the evidence, he had gathered all of it very carefully over the course of months. He himself claimed that he did not wish to present this evidence to his brothers because it would take too much time that it would mean that the corruption of his legion would be allowed to further spread throughout the ranks. But this too was pure nonsense. The corruption was already in the legion's blood. Conrad knew this. He had seen this in his visions. He simply did not wish to have this evidence presented to others, because it would in turn have presented itself as evidence of his own failure and he could not accept that. Conrad Curse could not accept that he had failed, because he was desperate to protect what remained of his fragile ego. And I speak not here of ego in the sense of excessive pride, I speak of the ego that every human being has, your very sense of self. Conrad had based his sense of self on the justness of his actions, he had killed and tortured thousands, if not tens of thousands. He had slaughtered his own sons when they proved to be corrupt. And he had done all of this in the name of a greater cause, in the name of justice, in the name of improving society and maintaining his legion. If it came to light then that all of these actions had been in vain, and that he had not been able to prevent anything, then his entire moral system, his entire reason for his actions, his entire rationale would vanish. The entire idea behind his rule of terror was that the ends justify the means. But if he had not achieved any of his ends, all he was left with was a long and bloody history of violence and torture in the name of nothing. It would reduce Conrad Curse from an optimistic idealist who wished to improve the world into nothing more than a sadistic monster that prowled the night for his own amusement. It would have broken whatever little remained of Conrad Curse's sanity. And so, as to protect himself from that, he invented the alter ego of the Night Haunter. The Night Haunter was the monster, Conrad Curse was the man, and as the ego of the Night Haunter began collapsing, the roles shifted. And Conrad's descent into insanity was complete. He could now gain no more comfort from his role as the Night Haunter than he could in his role as Conrad Curse. No matter how he looked at his past now, he had failed. This was made even further obvious by his hatred of his own sons, of his own legion. He hated the Night Lords, almost all of them, and even those he secretly loved, he chastised and condemned. Sevitar, one of the very few in the Legion that he respected and probably genuinely did like, he condemned to death at a time of the Night Haunter's choosing. Even those closest to him that seemed to share his ideals the most, he loathed, for they were nothing more than a corrupted mirror of himself. In them he saw both his greatest failures and his greatest aspirations. He saw everything he had hoped to build, and everything he had failed to build. Small wonder then, that at the end, when the Night Haunter was marching to his chamber to receive the assassin that would end his life, he did so with a light heart. He told himself that if nothing else, he chose this death. 
Regardless of whether or not he had had a choice in the matter, he wanted to die now. Because he knew that continuing to live on would cause him nothing but further misery. Conrad Curse had wanted to die for a very long time, and this was the only way in which he knew he could guarantee that death. And so ends the saga, the tragic story, of Conrad Curse and the Night Haunter. He tried to do good. I genuinely believe that maybe he could even have been a tool for justice. If only he had, perhaps, been less insane. The Emperor, or at least the apparition of the Emperor, claimed that Conrad Curse's insanity was not of his making, that it was granted to him by other forces. Whether or not that was truly the Emperor, or merely Conrad's mind speaking to him, I think it would be fairly safe to assume that the Emperor probably did not intend for Conrad to be insane. It seems far more likely that that was a result of his long, long journey through the warp, rather than any design. But perhaps even more important than his insanity, Conrad never gained a family, or even friends. As he says to himself, there were no friends for Conrad Curse. All of the other Primarchs, even Mortarion and Angron, eventually created their own little communities, their own followers. And whilst one could argue that Conrad did eventually garner followers of his own, he kept them at a distance. He hated them. Again, even the ones he loved and respected, he saw as twisted mirrors of himself, and so could not help but loathe them. And of course, during his entire period on Nostramo, no one took him in, and never did he create his own family either, this too as a result of his insanity. If he had indeed chosen to save and nurture that young boy on the rooftops of Nostramo, maybe Conrad Curse's fate could have been radically different. Maybe, maybe. That, by the way, is also a question that we will be asking and answering at some point in the future. I am thinking I'm going to do a series on the Primarchs that could have been how their lives could have been changed by small, seemingly insignificant changes. In the case of Conrad, it would be being adopted, for example, or creating his own family. In the case of Petarabo, it might be the joy of sharing his inventions. In the case of Angron, it might be something so simple as to reject the butcher's nails, instead of propagating them yet further within his legion. But that will have to be a subject for another day. For now, I will wrap up this Primark Lore video on Conrad Curse, which hopefully have given you a more in-depth understanding of the Primark of the Eighth Legion. A tragic villain that could have been a hero were it not for cruel and unjust circumstance. I have been Arch, thank you all very much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon. Until then, have a good day.